So tonight we have uh, Dr. Chris Harrell. Uh, he is uh, a marine archaeologist and the president of the Submerged Archaeological Conservancy International. Uh, his 27-year career has included pre-European contact and historic underwater sites uh, in coastal areas, rivers, and offshore sites in shallow waters and in extreme depths, uh, and emphasis on extreme. His expertise ranges from the 16th century Spanish colonial period to World War II, and he has sold or co-authored more than 25 publications. Uh, one of, like any good project, Chris is one of many very talented people who have come together uh, for this. And one of those other people who was not able to join us tonight is uh, Melanie, Melanie Damore. Um, and she is an, a very implemental part of this, of this project. And I'm sorry she couldn't join us. But for those of you that will be attending SHA, uh, looking forward to seeing both of you all there and hearing more uh, from Saki. So anyway, uh, without further ado, I'll turn over um, the presentation here to Dr. Harrell. Uh, please hold your questions until the end. And, uh, and thank you very much for, enjoy for joining us tonight, Chris. All right, thank you guys. I appreciate y'all having me. Um, I'm assuming you guys can see the screen. Yes. yes. Okay. And, le and let me add one quick note that um, <laughs> for those of you not presenting this evening, please do place your microphones on mute. Thank you. Right on. Um, you know, I wanna start this presentation off by sort of explaining to you how this all began. And <clears throat> it's really quite a, an interesting story, but uh, back in 1992, I was uh, an undergraduate in a Spanish colonial history course where I was uh, tasked with a final product uh, to come up with a, a screenplay or a, um, uh, yeah, basically a screenplay for a documentary. And we had to choose one aspect of the conquest of, of the Americas. And me being interested in Spanish colonial history and Spanish colonial archaeology and underwater archaeology, I decided that I was going to write a documentary up about the, uh, the scuttling event that took place in 1519 along the uh, Gulf Coast of Mexico. And so I did this thing. I wrote this big giant treatment up and I had Martin Sheen as part of the, uh, you know, the, the, the narrator of this thing. I had done all this great, you know, background research and and whatnot and um turned it in I, I expected to get an a and i i got a like a b or something like a b or c plus or i don't remember what but the funny part about it was that right from that point forward 27 28 years later i started this actual project this thing has been worked in the works for for over two decades and it has become a, a passion of mine uh, that, uh, you know, as you'll see here in a second, uh, just really is, is, is an important uh, part of what, um, what interests me, but also what I think is important in terms of, of understanding uh, the 16th century, the early 16th century. So uh, <clears throat> I'll go from there. So I don't know how many of you guys know the history of the conquest of Mexico. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail because it is quite extensive. It's it's really an interesting story. Uh, if you if you have interest in the story itself, I encourage you to read uh, either Hugh Thomas's uh, uh, Conquest or uh, Buddy Levy's uh, book, which is a, basically a, a, a rundown of the Conquest book by Hugh Thomas um, with a little bit more narration. Uh, I think that book is called Conquistador, but take a look at those two books if you're really interested in the conquest itself, but it's something uh, that, that's really, in my mind, one of the most fascinating uh, stories in human history, more so than even the um, discovery of the New World by Columbus in 1492. And so what I'd like to point out here is that, um, you know, in 1492, Columbus comes to the New World. Um, makes landfall, establishes towns, starts to build um, uh, the colonial uh, uh, regime there in, in the Caribbean, and they almost immediately start burning through Native Americans. And one of the things that really starts to, to become apparent uh, to the Spanish is that the, the folks there, they're interacting with the Tayano, the, uh, the Carib, and the Arawak, they are just basically wiping 
folks out with disease uh, uh, through um, their encomiendas and, and brutality, all these different uh, aspects of, of the colonial period was really just wiping these folks out and they were running out of slave labor. So what ends up happening is there starts to be a, a push for slave trading to go on illegally. And, and what I think probably was going on, and uh, there's uh, folks like Sam Turner, who um, I think he, he would agree with this, is that you're starting to see uh, expeditions that are not sanctioned, sanctioned by the crown going out and looking for slaves. And they end up down in, in Colombia, in the Darien, and different areas, but they, they don't necessarily make it west. They go east, they go up towards, uh, we believe, into Florida around 15, uh, early 1500s, maybe 1511 or so. They're, they're cruising around looking for, for different places to pull out people, but they're, um, you know, they also are running into problems, mostly legal problems. So in 1518, the governor of Cuba, an individual named Diego de Velasquez, uh, decided that it was time to start looking elsewhere for, um, for, for individuals to work the mines or the plantations or whatever. Now, under, this is all under the auspices of, of trying to, uh, you know, teach, um, you know, uh, the, the uh, sort of the Catholic faith and all these other sort of nefarious things that, that these folks were using to, to justify their, their, uh, their movement inland or out to uh, find slaves. But Diego Velasquez is, is able to get permission from the crown and he basically uh, is uh, able to um, contract an individual named Hernandez de Cordoba who left uh, Jamea, uh, Cuba in 1517 sailed west for about a month and ran into the Yucatan Peninsula, specifically Rosamon. And so Cordoba cruises around for a few months. He ends up getting in a, in a couple of uh, skirmishes with Native Americans and ends up back in Cuba. Uh, he's shot up with arrows, the whole nine yards. He lays in pain for 10 days. And he explains to Velasquez that there is this, what he called Gran Cairo. Uh, basically, what he's describing are the pyramids or the Maya structure, the structures that are associated with Mayan civilization, all these different things that none of these folks had seen up until this point. And so it really piques the interest of Velasquez. Cordoba dies. Velasquez says, all right, I'm going to send somebody else out there. So in 1518, he sends his nephew, Juan de Grijalva, out to do basically the same thing, reconnaissance and exploration uh, for the purposes of developing trade networks and finding folks they could bring back to work the, um, the plantations or, or whatnot. And Grijalva sails around again all the way up to uh, what is now today the um, Grijalva River just uh, north of Veracruz and uh, comes back, reports basically the same thing uh, and is looking to be the uh, the individual who will be sanctioned again to go back on behalf of Velasquez, who is uh, uh, putting together all these uh, uh, exploits. And essentially what ends up happening is uh, Velasquez decides that he will ask Hernan Cortez to go and, uh, and continue exploration and uh, efforts to uh, build trade networks and and find slaves, etc. So Cortez leaves in 1518 for uh, March, I'm sorry, February of 1518 from Cuba, and he sails west to uh, Mexico and makes landfall um, there in around March of, of 1518, and then starts to cruise up uh, the coast, the Gulf Coast of Mexico, where he arrives at uh, San Juan de Aula. Um, when he left Cuba, he left with 11 ships, 500 men, and he starts almost immediately running into these really complex societies, these really complex uh, chieftains, things that, again, they had never seen before. And they start to realize that what they're involved in here is something much, much uh, bigger than anything that they had seen. And um, 
the, the other thing that starts to happen is he's interacting with Aztec emissaries that have been dispatched by Tenochtitlan, by um, Latexuma, the Aztec Empire, uh, to, to figure out who these people were. Because up until this point, it's almost assured that the, uh, the, the Aztecs were aware of Cordoba, they were aware of Grijalva. They didn't really have much time to interact with them, but they knew when Cortez arrived with his 11 ships, 500 men, horses, cannon, and all this stuff, that there was something really going on here. And so they start sending out these Aztec emissaries to, um, to investigate, and they start to interact with one another. Um, one of the things that Cortez does is he dispatches his uh, one of his captains, Montejo, to sail north to start to find a suitable harbor. Now, late May, Cortez, and he probably had figured on doing this before he left Cuba. There's no way to really know this for sure, but he basically decided that he was going to, instead of do what his contract was, which was to explore and establish trade relations, he decided he was going to establish a town. And the reason he does this, and he does this just on paper, but the reason he does this is that by establishing a town in the name of the crown, uh, he is no longer subject to the authority of the Cuban governor who is financing, backing, and permitting this exploration. He is now subject to the crown, to Charles V. And this legal maneuver basically allows him to just cut ties with just about anything and everything related to Cuba. Now, of course, his men weren't very happy about this, and we'll get into that in a second. But this maneuver is really what sort of starts the process of, of getting to the place where he's going to scuttle these vessels. Um, Monteo continues to go up and down the coast, and he arrives at the Totonac town of Kiwitlan. Um, and that's where the construction of Villarica de la Veracruz, the town that Cortez uh, founded on paper, that's where this begins. And that's July of 1519. Um, one thing I want to point out here, and, and, you know, I always laugh when I hear uh, folks in St. Augustine or Pensacola argue about the earliest town in North America. It, it's not those two places, it's actually Villarica, but nobody, nobody seems to ever want to embrace that. Now, the funny thing is Villarica was really a small little town, consisted of, a, of some fortifications, uh, a church, and a few other structures. It wasn't really much of anything, but the point is that it was established in the name of the crown, and that's when Cortez starts to draft the first letters uh, that he sent, first of five letters that he sends back to um, Charles V, uh, and the first one being written at Villarica. He also sends a petition where he forces everybody to sign their name in order to show alliance, allegiance to Cortez and allegiance to the crown as opposed to um, uh, Velasquez. And at this point, he, Cortez starts to realize that he's got um, folks that are not excited about this idea. By this point in the, in the story, they are starting to see massive sacri sacrifices going on at these major temple, uh, temple um, uh, these major uh, temple features. They're, they're, there's all sorts of, of things happening that these, uh, you know, Catholic subjects of the crown and, and, and those obligated to uh, Velasquez are, are realizing that this is a really, really dangerous venture they are involved in. And the things that Cortez is doing by, you know, cutting ties to Cuba and, and doing his own thing is, is really putting, um, um, putting them, them all in, in danger. So there's, there's, a, there's a series of mutinies that start to occur. And Cortez is able to, to end all of the mutinies, but it, it's a constant problem. And on top of that, Cortez has lost several of his 500 men, and he needs additional men in order to continue forward with this, this venture. He is focused now on, on heading to uh, west to, uh, uh, to Nochtelon. He's focused on, on keeping his town going. He's focused on, on this conquest. 
Uh, and in order to do this, he orders 10 of his 11 ships scuttled um, after uh, quelling the last mutiny. Now, sometime around July 26th or so, Monteo and another uh, captain, Puerto Carrero, both depart for Spain aboard the flagship Santa Maria de la Concepcion. And they are ordered by Cortes to go straight to uh, Spain with these letters to explain to the king what's happening so that, you know, if there's any problems, he's legally in the clear. And of course, they're told, go straight to Spain, don't stop in Cuba, but they stopped in Cuba on their way to Spain. And this tipped off uh, Velasquez as to what was going on. Velasquez is hearing the stories now of, of uh, what not only what is taking place to his men and his expedition, but he's also hearing the stories about the gold and the silver and the quetzal feathers and the cotton and all the different things that are on board this vessel that is headed back to Spain. Um, mostly as tribute to the king, also more or less to bribe them to, uh, to ensure that Cortez keeps his, his uh, place on uh, in, in this, uh, this venture. The Cortez, they head off. They actually are able to beat the governor before the governor can, can stop them. Um, I'm sorry, Monteo and Puerto Carrero, they stop in Cuba and they're able to take off to Spain before they are captured by the governor. But the governor, again, is aware of all this and he, is, uh, he starts to plan uh, a um, sort of a, a response. Oops. Sorry about that. In April of 1520, Panfilio de Narvaez, who's also the same Panfilio de Narvaez that explored uh, Florida in the, in the 1530s, he arrived with 18 ships and 900 men under the orders of Velasquez to arrest Cortez. In mid-April, and by this point, Cortez has already made his way to Tenochtitlan. So he's already interacting with um, uh, Montezuma. He's already interacting with the, the Aztec Empire in the Valley of Mexico um, when he learns of, of Narvaez's arrival. So uh, in mid-April of 1520, Cortez learns of Narvaez's arrival and he departs um, Tenochtitlan back to the Gulf Coast, uh, back to Villarica, leaving some of his forces behind. And at the, uh, at the, at the Battle of Sempuala, which is a, a, a Totonac site not too far away from Veracruz, Villarica, that is, um, Cortez is able to defeat Narvaez um, and his men. Basically, he ends up bribing everybody to come work for him. He's able to uh, uh, defeat Narvaez. I think he pulls out his eye, does a bunch of things to him, sends him to Villarica for three years to sit in a, in a jail cell. And he takes um, 16 of his eight, uh, 18 ships and scuttles those again in, in the harbor there at Villarica. After this, Cortez returns to Tenochtitlan and um, with the allegiance of uh, indigenous um, Aztec enemies and others, he's able to defeat the empire, the Aztec empire in 1521. Again, that's a really very brief synopsis of what takes place between 1519 and 1521. I would encourage you all to read the story because it's an amazing uh, uh, adventure. Uh, but suffice it to say that you know, these decisions that Cortez is making, the decision to scuttle his vessels, the decision to uh, uh, part from the, the, uh, the Cuban governor, all these things are, are being done. They're, they're calculated. Uh, one of the things that we think he did, uh, one of the reasons we think he scuttled the vessels was he was uh, short of men and he needed uh, sailors. And if you don't have vessels, and your sailors don't have vessels, they're now soldiers. And so he was conscripting some of these sailors into his little army to, to move westward. So there's a lot of things going on, a lot of uh, parts, moving parts in this whole story. But suffice it to say that he makes a series of calculated moves and begins um, the conquest. In so now what I wanna do is talk about the project itself. Um, this, what you're seeing here is the area, um, this is Villarica today, the town of what's, what's called Playa de Villarica. Uh, Playa Villarica. 
which is basically just a small little fishing village of about 140 or so people. Um, it's a, about an hour north of present day Veracruz. Um, and it's in a highly volcanic region. We'll talk about that here in a second. I want to point out here, I don't, can you guys see my cursor? Yes, no? Okay. If you look north here, there's this basalt um, anazite rock formation. And there's another one right here. And I want to just keep those two places in mind. Uh, again, this area is, is it's located in the, uh, the central zone of the Gulf of Mexico in Veracruz State. Um, the project area is all through up in here. The, the original town of Villa Rica de la Veracruz, the remains of it are still there today and they're right up, up here on this alluvial plain. Uh, we also have uh, water um, and, and sediments flowing in from this um, lagoon feature here. And I think this just opens and closes all the time. Uh, but suffice it to say that this is one of the features, one of the reasons we will talk about uh, the unique preservation that we have at these sites in a moment. Um, <clears throat> let's see. One of the things that uh, Montejo describes in his um, uh, his adventure going north uh, after being asked by Cortez to do that, to go look for suitable harbor, is he comes back and he talks about a fortified town near, you know, a safe harbor. And what he's discussing or describing is this place called Pia Huitzlan, which is a post-classic Totonac site that dates from approximately eight, 900 to 1521 or thereabouts. Um, basically what it is, it's a ceremonial complex as well as a um, cemetery for elites. And what you're seeing here, down here, is these little cemetery features uh, are where um, elite members of, of the Totonac Society would, would have their bones uh, played. Again, you'll see right here is that large basalt feature that I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, this large um, feature you're seeing here is um, the remnants of, of a volcano of a volcano that is long dead, long dormant, and um, it's highly eroded. Let's see. So again, our project area, this is that feature I was talking about earlier. This is the other reef feature that's out there. This is that, that water that's flowing into the bay. And we did quite a bit of research trying to make sure this was exactly the right spot. We had um, historical data um, and information from the Mexican um, um, archives and from uh, ENA, the, the National Institute of Anthropology and History. We had all that, but we really wanted to, to look around to see if we could find some additional information uh, that could tie in this area a little bit better. And one of the things that we ran across, and which I still today pretty fascinated by is this image right here. Um, this is a uh, Kislyak painting number two. It was painted sometime in the um, mid 17th century by an unknown artist. There's actually a series of eight of these paintings that detail or document the conquest of Mexico. These were painted for um, the last Habsburg uh, uh, king of Spain who was fascinated with the story of the conquest of Mexico. So he had these things uh, painted for him. What's interesting is he had them painted, he paid for them, they were headed over to uh, Spain on a ship and they were shipwrecked off of Africa. Some pirates came and took them, took them over to, to um, England and ransomed them. The king wouldn't pay for them twice. So they sat there for a hundred years, moved around several times, ended up in the um, uh, Spanish embassy in uh, England, and then finally um, were purchased by the Mexican uh, government, and then again purchased by the Kisiak Foundation. And these now, all eight of these paintings are now living in the um, uh, Library of Congress. So if you're up in that neck of the woods, you can see these, these individual paintings themselves. 
what you're seeing here, I think, is this. This is that basalt feature right here, back behind here. And this is a, this reef feature, basically, which translates to, um, you know, nougat reef, which is a very strange name. But, but that's what I think you're seeing here. And what this tells us and what, if, what we realized as we were doing the research on this project, as we were coming up on it, uh, was that whoever had painted these pictures had been to a lot of these sites. These are, are likely uh, Mexican um, painters who were contracted to do this, and they had knowledge or at least had visited these sites at some time uh, in the past prior to painting these, these images. So we thought that was a really neat sort of tie-in. Unfortunately, the vessels that they're using here are not uh, period, uh, they're not accurate for the period, but it does show you that they are lining themselves up around this reef feature, which is kind of key to some of the, uh, the findings that we have later on, and you'll see that here in a minute. Again, one last shot of our project area. This is looking out the, the big basalt feature again right here. What you're seeing right here are the remains of the fortification at Villarica de la Veracruz. We actually got a chance. We were able to come out and we cleared the entire area to get um, some drone footage of it. And uh, what we ended up finding was not just this, but the remains of the church as well as um, what initially was considered to be a, um, a kiln it, it actually looks more like a, um, uh, a cistern. And the reason we think it's a cistern is there's no running water or no uh, water up in this, up on this uh, flat plain. All the water is basically down uh, on the beach front. Um, sorry about that. On the beach front there where the water comes from the lagoon. So we are thinking that they were collecting water during the rainy season in that neck of the woods. One question that we always get is, did Cortez uh, issue an order to ships? And I guarantee you, if you Google Cortez and his ships right now, you're going to get something on, on Wikipedia or Google or something that says he, he burned his ships. This is, in fact, not the case. Um, there's been a lot of research done over the last uh, 100 years or so uh, that indicates that this myth uh, actually is exactly that. It's, it's uh, an attempt to tie Cortez to events that took place in antiquity, such as uh, Alexander's burning of the ships. And this is all detailed in Matthew Restall's work, as well as um, uh, an individual named Reynolds, who did a, a, seminal, paper, a seminal paper back in uh, the 50s that addresses this issue. Uh, but unfortunately, it's still today. You, you see it everywhere. Um, and it, you know, it is what it is. The, um, and I'll get into the reasons why he didn't burn those in a little bit, but just suffice it to say that, you know, that aspect of this story is, is in fact not true. One thing that we ran across in our, our, our found a lot of interesting things, you know, a lot of images of Cortez, a lot of images that you see here of the, the scrolling event uh, the documentation. A lot of the things that we found, um, actually this thing at Jalapa, the, uh, uh, the two, the, the cross there is supposed to be from the remains of one of the vessels itself, uh, from the, uh, um, I guess, some of the timbers from the mast, but uh, nobody knows for sure. At any rate, one of the things that we started to um, to look at was to see if there was anything beyond simply Cortez's mention of destroying the ships, which is basically one line in one letter that says, I had these ships, you know, destroyed. Uh, in other document or other books, other um, biographies, it's, it's built up. And as I said earlier, uh, throughout the rest of the of the 16th and into the early 17th century, you start to see these stories about burning ships and whatnot. Um, but in reality, it, it's it's not very clear, especially from Cortez, what he actually had done. And so we um, we started to look at different uh, documents just to see if there was something else out there that might might hint at a um, at 
of what may have taken place. And one of the things that we ran across um, was a or lawsuit that uh, between um, a number of lawsuits between Cortez and Velasquez after the conquest was over. But there was the testimony of this one individual, Diego Alvea, who basically uses the, the phrase dar al traves, which if you translate it today, it means to go through or push through. But if you look at it in the, in the, in the context of the 16th century, and we found this through uh, looking at different uh, uh, documents and different dictionaries um, that have been published, dar al traves actually means to capsize or to turn over. So it was an interesting discovery because we had, we had never seen this before. Again, it's always the burning of the ships or he beached them or he took them all apart or he did this. This was the first example that we had run across that actually said something other than, than that. And so the idea was that, uh, that maybe these, these vessels capsized as they were sinking. Different kinds of vessels we're talking about. There are basically three vessels that Cortez brought with him. There were caravelles, nows, and the Virgentines. The caravelles and the nows are, are, are the same vessels that are used by Cologne, by others as they come across um, uh, during the period of exploration. Uh, these are Latin rigged vessels. Uh, the nows themselves, and they're smaller, more maneuverable. They often are, are uh, armed fairly well and they're able to um, uh, sail to windward uh, quicker. The nows themselves are more like storage vessels, uh, or storage vessels. They're more like vessels that carry a, a lot of stores uh, for, and supplies for these kinds of, of events. And then there's these Vergentines, which are these road vessels that um, you know, are, are similar to the ones you would think you would see in, in places like the Mediterranean. And, um, what we believe he was doing with these vessels, and we know for a fact that he had at least um, two, if not three, they were using these vessels to row upstream and row up rivers to explore, uh, whereas these other vessels weren't able to do that. So there's, there's these three vessels that we are, we're primarily interested in looking for. And, um, you know, to date, uh, there's not been a definitive um, identification of a caravel or one of these Vergentines in the New World, at least not as far as I know of. Uh, you can see here, there's a series of, of different vessels that have been documented uh, from the 16th century. But again, it's not clear whether or not they are actually nows or caravels. I'm sorry, not necessarily certain that they're caravels. We do have a couple of nows uh, and galleons. And again, no Vergentines. Um, let's see. In the project area itself, one of the, the, the first and the only expedition ever um, attempted to identify the location of the vessels was conducted in 1892 by this individual, Francisco, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Francisco de Paso de Troncoso. Um, essentially what he did was he hired the Mexican Navy to bring some divers. I know it's a hard photo to see, but this is a diver being lowered into the water. And they essentially just wandered around on the seafloor looking for shipwrecks. And I don't think they had a clue what they were looking for other than basically a ship on the bottom. Uh, needless to say, they were, un, uh, they were unsuccessful in, in finding anything, but this is the first and the only uh, documented um, archeological investigations uh, looking for these wrecks in this area. So fast forward to 2018, which was the first year of our project, um, things were a little bit different, as you can see. Um, we were using, um, our initial field work began in 2018. And as I said earlier, this is a highly magnetic area. Um, again, the basalt feature to the top here, this, this reef feature right there, and you can see the magnetic signature of the earth is quite loud. Um, and it presents a problem for us, not just in terms of using uh, the magnetometer, but also in terms of using metal detectors and other uh, items or other tools to identify the location of these sites. So in 2019, you know, things uh, changed, and I'll talk about that here in a second. 
the logistics of working in this area is quite unique. There are no piers, there are no docks, there are nothing. It, it's basically, like I said, a small um, uh, remote fishing village today. And uh, we were fortunate enough that we were able to stay at a hotel and we were fortunate enough to have some really great folks to work with there in the town that uh, loaned us their vessels. And just to give you a sense of what our, our lives are like every day, and we work every day, you know, we're loading up all this equipment, we're, we're filling our own tanks, we're loading the boats up, we're, we're taking out food, we're taking out remote sensing equipment, all sorts of stuff. And just to give you sort of an idea of what, what this is like, I, I like to call this the Via Rica CrossFit program. Hopefully this works. And this boat is completely loaded up with, <laughs> with everything we need in order to do survey work. And I always like, and Brendan and, and John will know the guy in the front there. That's Fritz Hanselman, one of our project PIs. It's myself and a number of other folks trying to push this boat into the water. And this is a day-to-day -day thing. We actually have two vessels we use every day to do the same, to, to do this work. And not only do we pull them into the water, we push them out. I like this because here comes Melanie and she just shows up and then just the whole thing goes in the water super quick, which says something about my friend, the Viking. But suffice it to say, it's a lot of work and, you know, every day is, is uh, it's a workout for sure. But it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun as well. So in order to do this project uh, and to do it in a way that we were going to be able to identify uh, the location of, of these vessels, we, we really had to, to figure out um, a way that we were going to be able to delineate targets from this really loud magnetic seafloor or geology that we were dealing with. And the first year we were out there, we ran a, a very tight uh, line spacing, uh, basically at a 10 meter line spacing, uh, running just a single magnetometer and a side scan sonar to see what was out there on the seafloor. And we were able to come up with a number of targets um, and were, were successful as well. But it was quite um, labor intensive and it took quite a while to get the data so that we could start the process of diving these targets. And of course, once we were able to get the data processed and, and we reviewed it, we started looking at, um, at specific areas to uh, probe, to uh, excavate, and um, to, to see if we could identify anything. You can see here in the middle, there's somebody using a uh, metal detector. These things were absolutely useless on this project. They sang the entire time they were in the water. You couldn't tune it in any way to get it to work. Uh, just the magnetic nature of the sediments was, was enough to send them off. So we were really clueless in a lot of ways looking around on the seafloor. We were able though, uh, let's see if I can do this. We were able to identify um, one anchor though in, in the process of, of doing this. And this thing was buried about a meter deep. It took us about four days to dig it out. And it... Um, was quite interesting in that it was, it almost immediately looked 16th century um, to us. And one of the reasons I say that is you can see this fluke here. I'll have another picture here. This fluke here is very similar to one that was um, recorded off of uh, a vessel called um, the San Juan, or what's, what's known by archaeologists as the Red Bay Wreck from 1565. And that really sort of clued us in. What was even more fascinating was after we were able to terrace it out, and it, like I said, took us about four days, we were able to not only identify, you know, the size of the anchor and, and, and see its, um, see how it was constructed. Um, we also identified a wooden stock. And what's interesting about this is, um, this is not, a, this is not something you normally find in the archeological record um, when it comes to, to uh, vessels like this in, in these warm waters. And what I think is going on here, you, you remember I mentioned earlier that the sediments are coming out of that lagoon. Uh, I think what's happening is we're getting this mixture of mud 
and um, uh, uh, sand that's covering up uh, these these um, sites, and it's it's actually aiding in the preservation of the wood. In addition, if you look close to the ring here, you'll see a piece of rope that's still attached to it. So the preservation potential in the area is quite uh, quite quite good, and it was very exciting for us uh, in a lot of ways. So we took um, we took the uh, uh, a sample of the wood and we reburied the entire anchor, uh, sent that off for a, um, a radiocarbon analysis, and came back with some dates of 1417 to 1490, and the wood itself is actually a uh, wood that is native to um, uh, the Basque region of Spain. What's interesting about that is that at this period of time, the 16th, the 15th, 16th, um, and even into the 17th century, a lot of anchors that are being made uh, in Spain, almost all of them are coming exclusively from the Basque region. In fact, almost all the vessels, uh, well, I wouldn't say all of them, but a, a majority of vessels uh, that are built in the old world at that time are coming from the Basque region, um, at least in the early part of the 16th century. Um, and again, it's a type of red oak from the Canterbury Island um, mountains there in, in the Basque region. So we had a lot of lessons we learned in 2018 and we came back um, with some funding from ENA in 2019 to continue uh, the survey work and to, to start to dive additional targets that we had identified in 2019. Um, so what we did was uh, we, we brought two of these magnetometers out as well as a base station. And what we would do is we take this base station out. This is a base station magnetometer that we would drop in the water way off site and it would collect the Earth's ambient magnetic field throughout the day so that we could correct for uh, any of the magnetic differences that we were seeing in the data, as well as cleaning up the, the geology enough so that we could see the differences and changes that are being made by things such as anchors or cannon or whatever, because the magnetometer itself, as you likely know, only identifies ferrous um, objects. And so what we, we we did was we took this this base station mag and we put it out in the water and then we decided to tow two magnetometers in uh, tandem at about seven meters apart so we were able to cut our line spacing down uh, substantially and cover more ground at the same time and uh, this produced amazing results in terms of what the seafloor looked like and um, and cleaning it up and giving us really discrete targets. And you'll see that here in a second. The other thing, and this was the game changer for us um, more than anything, was the development of this tool here, which is basically a handheld magnetometer. But it's different from other magnetometers or ma handheld magnetometers in the sense that it's, it's passive. It's simply listening to the Earth's ambient magnetic field. And what you're seeing here is this diver holding the magnetometer by, with his hand and listening to the changes in the tones that the magnetometer is producing. And as the tones got weaker and weaker and weaker, the closer and closer and closer you became, you got to the target. And when it went quiet, you were on top of it. And this tool allowed us to start finding other targets in the area that we were interested in and in areas that we had already uh, completed survey work. So in using this, we were out able to find an additional uh, two anchors. Um, the, the first anchor I just showed you is actually anchor number two. Anchor number one is a modern anchor, um, and we just refer to the, the wooden stock anchor as number two. Anchor number three was substantially larger, but buried even deeper. And we were able to excavate this out, uh, and uh, it, it itself is also a 16th century anchor. The lugs here are uh, parallel with the, um, uh, the flukes, which is a, a, a typical of the 16th century. They don't change the orientation of the, the stock lugs uh, to perpendicular till much later. So we know that this is an earlier anchor and it's buried quite deep. Um, and through the use of that handheld mag, we were able to identify its location. On top of which, 
by doing that, we were able to, um, to get some photogrammetry. These are not the best images, unfortunately, but again, you can see some of the, uh, of the, the detail here. But we also um, had, I'm sorry, we were able to find, oh man, this isn't working. Sorry, guys. An additional anchor, anchor number four. Again, same story, buried really deep. Um, its stock lugs are parallel to the, um, uh, uh, to the, um, to the palms of the anchor. And there was a number of pieces of wood that we were able to collect. And that wood came back as the same species of wood that we were identifying. Um, uh, we identified with that first wooden stock that we saw back in 2018. The other interesting thing that we started to see, which we hadn't seen much of before, were river cobbles and um, um, basically what appears to be ballast. And some of it was concreted to the anchors, but um, what it's starting to tell us is that we're close to something nearby. Now, what's important about all this is, um, and if you're interested in details like measurements and whatnot, I'm certainly happy to, to go over that. I don't wanna bore you too much. But what you're seeing here um, is our project area here. Right. This is the area where the concentration of the anchors appears to be. So anchor number two is here, three and four. There's this feature here and this feature here. Via Rica is back here. And so what we've done is you can see here, here's anchor number two and its signature. And just behind it are some very light um, magnetic anomalies. And this is one area that we've got to go back and take a look at. Again, you'll see the same thing here at anchor number three. Again, very light patterning of, of anomalies. And then finally, the anchor four, we don't necessarily have anything behind it, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it's a little deeper. It could be, there could be something there. We're not sure yet. One of the things that the conquest narratives talk about is the stripping of the vessels. And what they mean by that, I think, is by taking off as much of the rigging, as much, uh, you know, obviously any guns, any supplies that they could possibly use for the conquest. But they had these hulks and they had these things that they couldn't just simply beach. They had to take them out in deeper water. These water depths range between 40 and 55 feet. Uh, 40 feet being uh, where anchor number two is and 55 here where anchor number four is. What we're thinking is happening is, and the orientation of these anchors too, by the way, is running north-south. So this is going south, north here. And so um, what we think is happening here is we have these, these anchors lined up here and then we have these discrete patterns behind there and we have these orientations. And so one of the theories that we're operating with right at the moment is that these hull remains are basically gonna be nothing more than wood and um, iron spikes, anything they weren't able to pull off of it. We think that they sank them in these water depths because of the mutinies and everything else that was going on at that time, simply beaching these things and leaving people behind would um, basically amount to folks fixing these vessels and going back to Cuba. So in order to get rid of them, in order to not just have them up on the beach or whatever, I think what they may have done is taken these things out into this deeper water, anchored them up, and then scuttled them. And what you're seeing here is this line of vessels right here. And one of the things that we've been considering is that there's all these potential vessels that supposedly are out there. There's the 10 ships that Cortez scuttled in 1519, and then the additional 16 that were scuttled uh, from Narvaez's fleet. So there's the potential for upwards to 26 or 24 vessels in this area. And so what we're thinking they're doing is they're just lining these things up along or near this feature, and they're forcing this 
basically is becoming a hazard to navigation. And what we're thinking they may be doing is they're forcing people to come around north of this point between this feature here in the shallower water in front of the, vi the village, um, uh, Via Rica de la Veracruz. We think that's what they're doing in order to protect themselves from, uh, you know, potential problems from the governor or anybody else who might have a beef with Cortez and his men. So this is, this is where our thinking is at the moment. And this is kind of where we're at uh, in terms of our research. We had planned to go out in 2020 and again in 2021. And of course, COVID wrecked that for us. Um, so we're right now in the process of uh, building out a, a series of grants uh, to go back out this year and continue this work. And what we want to do is on top of going back out and, and looking at these anomalies with um, uh, the, the handheld magnetometer, we also want to take a um, parametric sub-bottom profiler out and see if we can identify these, uh, these areas where these hulls may be. Uh, again, like with that wooden um, stock, we feel like there should be some fairly decent preservation. There may not be a lot of hull structure there, but we do feel like if there is that, that structure there, then you know, preservation may be very good, at least enough for us to, to document um, these remains. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at at the moment. I hope this made sense. I feel like I kind of rambled there. Uh, but if you have any questions or, or whatever, please hit me up. This is just a, our end slide, but it basically shows you all of our, oops, all the various sponsors and folks that have helped us um, uh, throughout the last two years. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that the first year of the project was uh, funded by the National Geographic Society and the second year was funded by uh, Mexico's uh, uh, Institute National Anthropology and Historia. So with that, I'll leave it open to any questions and, and please, you know, if you're confused or whatever, please let me know. I'll see if I can clear it up. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, as always, I'll, I'll follow up by saying, when can we join you? <laughs> I know everybody here wants to go down to uh, dive in Veracruz. Well, I, I, I don't know if you've told them, Brendan, but Brendan actually helped us. One of the things that we were trying to sort out um, in 2019 was what exactly would a pile of wood and nails look like? And so oh, yeah. I contacted Brendan with this crazy idea that we would go over to uh, what's known as the Spring Break Wreck in uh, St. Augustine. Actually, it's not in St. Augustine. It's, uh, where is that? It's uh, uh, up at the uh, Guanatolomato Matanzas uh, National Estuarine Research Reserve. <laughs> like, like to plug our research reserves when we can. Right. So we, uh, we, we contacted Brendan. We came up with this idea of, of um, stripping ourselves down of anything of metal and carrying magnetometers over the top of this remains of this um, side of a of a shipwreck that washed up on the beach a couple years before. And the idea was to just see if we could determine what a signature would look like. Because again, they scuttled these vessels, they likely took everything they possibly could off of the vessels themselves. And we're really looking for a very, very discreet pile of nails and wood. And uh, that we think we're, we're seeing here, but you know, still remains to be seen. But Brendan helped us out, so I'm, I'm gonna bring him down to Mexico. <laughs> that was a hot day in the parking lot walking a magnetometer around. Yep, <laughs> and Lily too. So. Yeah, no, that was a good team, team effort. Um, cool, yeah, I'm looking forward to grabbing some more uh, magnetic signatures up here. We're in the process of accessioning a um, a magnetometer from the Submerged Resources Center with National Park Service. So it's on, we, we're in the process of the accepting, acceptance right now, which we'll go through. And uh, anyway, looking forward to getting that in use here. Cool, cool. I was, uh, I had a good quick meeting today with the National Park Service uh, at Petersburg. We were working down there at City Point and there's probably one of the largest clusters of wreck debris in Virginia in one place in that area and all sorts of other stuff in the water because of the Civil War and 400 years of continual occupation. But um, 
I, I think we're, we're going to hatch something fun between the Submerged Resource Center and uh, Monitor National Marine Sanctuary and, and, uh, and do some good survey out there. So stay cool. tuned. Yeah. I need to put you in. I, uh, you're, well, you're welcome to join us, but it's not like Via Rica. <laughs> <laughs> Hope well is not Via Rica. <laughs> no. Well, you know, one, one of the, the interesting things that's come out of this project is the development of that handheld mag, which again is, is different than mm -hmm. any of the handhelds that I've ever used before. I mean, this Absolutely. thing, you know, most of these things are, are designed to, to sing when they find something. This thing actually is listening to the earth as it changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. closer you get to it and what we're what's what's neat about this is that um the folks at marine magnetics uh developed that for this project for the express purpose of trying to find these holes oops oh, sorry about that um the express purpose of trying to find these hole remains but the um uh what, what's ended up happening is these guys now have a, a new tool to help uh, find unexplored ordnance and do work on pipelines and all sorts of other things that you know they aren't necessarily able to do before. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how this project is sort of fueling other things. Mm -hmm. Bill, you need to get one of those handheld mags to find anchors in the James River. <laughs> yeah, tell me. Well, however, 11 ton anchor is not hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> now, when they put power lines across a river, right over where they are, yeah. Unless you got cesium, and I don't. I have a proton. So yeah, Josh has a uh, magnetometer that uh, when you're over iron, the sound cuts off. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure of the make of it, but uh, we we tried it out at Yorktown, and uh, it works. Right on. How have um, back to the Cortez project? With the, let's say, the pandemic easing and all of that, um, how have, has that affected the, the Mexican government's ability to participate in the project, to endow it, to support it? Ha has that relationship remained strong? Well, one of the things that happened um, early on in the project, and, and one of the reasons Nat Geo funded it was the fact that um, we started in 15, I'm sorry, in, in 1518. We started in... Um, Just seems like it. Yeah. <laughs> we started in 2018, which was the 500th anniversary of the Grijalva expedition. And then 2019 was the 500th anniversary of, of the Cortez expedition. And then all the way up to um, this, this year, which is 50, uh, 2021, 500th anniversary of the fall of Tenochtitlan. So up until this year, uh, they were certainly willing to help us any, any way they possibly could. Um, but when we got to, to the 2021, the 500th anniversary of the fall of Tenochtitlan, and they all of a sudden decided they didn't want to talk about Cortez anymore. They want to focus more on the indigenous story, which is understandable. I mean, certainly it was a very brutal uh, experience for, for anybody who was involved in that, uh, in the conquest. And um, it was, it, you know, it, it, it certainly is understandable. One of the interesting things that I found in this whole experience is that in Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, there is a, a hatred for Cortez. In fact, there's there's almost zero, there's zero information about the guy. He's even buried there. Mm -hmm. He's in he's in a church right there near where the location near the location where Montezuma and Cortez met for the first time in November of 1519. He's buried right there. But you know, you wouldn't know it unless you, you went into the church and found him. Um, so throughout the city and even south in Cuyacan and different places, he's, he's reviled, he's hated. And, um, but as you get further out from the city, and this sort of speaks to the alliances that Cortez built as he moved into, uh, towards the conquest, uh, you start to see a change in the attitude. So when you get to Veracruz, for example, there are buses that are driving around that say 500th anniversary of the conquest of Mexico, 500th anniversary of the founding of Veracruz, all these great things. And, and what's, what's kind of neat about it is um, that's kind of the same sort of attitude that existed in, in, in the 16th century there in Mexico. The center of power here 
had a very you know uh, tight control over everything but as you branch out further and further they seem to lose control and so the folks in in Veracruz or along the Gulf Coast uh, where Cortez began the conquest sort of embrace him whereas in Mexico City even today he's he's reviled so it's it's kind of an interesting um, thing that that's even continues today uh, in terms of, of just how the power structures work and and how they view history uh, but to sort of circle back um, you know they they really did not have uh, a lot of interest in us being down there in 50 or in 2021 uh, just because of the anniversary and because we would be working right up until August 13th which is the day of the fall of Tenochtitlan and they certainly didn't want us down there digging around for Cortez's stuff. I am told now that things are settling down and so we'll be able to go back out without much problem. Um, and that's the point of us writing the grants that we're, we're currently writing. Well, we certainly wish you the best of luck with us. No, thanks, man. Yeah. Well, thanks again for joining us tonight and to all of our members, uh, this will be recorded and posted online for those of us that couldn't be here tonight. Um, we will be sending out a Zoom invite for the next presentation, which will be given by uh, Patrick Boyle, and that's going to be about a unique style of bug eye uh, located in Washington, North Carolina. That uh, was the subject of his master's research at East Carolina University. So I uh, look forward to seeing you then. Um, I'm going to put a pin in the Christmas gathering. I was not able to score our Richmond location this year, so if somebody has somewhere else, somewhere else we can meet, uh, I'll open up the farm here. Uh, let me know. Send me an email. Uh, I'd still be glad, would be happy to see everybody and get together. Uh, but thanks for joining us tonight, and we appreciate uh, you, Dr. Hell, and telling us about the lost ships of Cortez. <laughs>